Mikrofon. Oke. Oke, Wista. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to Semilin 2020. Semilin is stand for Seminar on Electronic and Instrumentation that held this year by Electronic and Instrumentation Laboratory, Department of Computer Science and Electronic, Faculty Mathematics and Natural Science, Universitas Gajah Mada. Collaborating with Student Association of Electronic and Instrumentation. In 2020, we must follow the health regulation because of corona pandemic. So this year, we had the semilins online like this. We hope this pandemic is quickly over, then we can recover again to our usual activity. Okay, let me introduce myself. My name is Rogit Muhammad Wujia. I'm a lecturer in the in Department of Computer Science and Electronics, and I will be serving as your moderator today. First of all, I would like to thank Dr. Agus Harjoko as head of the Department of Computer Science and Electronics. Also, thanks to Dr. Andi Darmawan as head of Electronic and Instrumentation Research Lab for supervising this event. Then, I would like to thanks to all of the audience. Thank you for joining this seminar. Okay, before we start the presentation, I would like to read the sequence of this seminar. The seminar is divided to the six sessions. The first session is opening speech from the head of the Department of Computer Science and Electronics. The second session is main presentation from Professor Dr. Tehan Robert Tablatnik. The third uh, session is discussion for the main presentation. The fourth session is second presentation from Mr. Aufaklas Zatu Kusuma Friski, SSEMSC. And the five uh, session is discussion for the second presentation. And the last one, the sixth session, is closing. And now, for the opening speech, I would like to invite Dr. Agus Harjoko as the head of the Department of Computer Science and Electronics. So to Dr. Agus Harjoko, time is yours. Still mute, Pak Agus. Okay. Dr. Agus Harjoko, still mute. Can oh, you sorry. On? Okay. Uh, thank you, Pak Lukman. Uh, Good morning, uh, Professor Sablatnik. Uh, it is um, very nice and very honorable for us to have you as our guest here uh, in our uh, seminar series, which is called the um, uh, Semilins. Uh, I'm sorry that I have to welcome this speech from just uh, beside the highway between Jogja and Solo, if you, have, you happen to know uh, Jogja. Uh, so once again, we are very thankful for your uh, time you spend with us uh, this afternoon in Indonesia, but this morning in uh, Austria. And also we thanks to uh, everyone um, in this team to make this event a success. And also I would like to thank also to um, Mas Frisky, who will be the second speaker this afternoon. Uh, so. Uh, I, I don't want to uh, take a long time because of um, probably noisy from the street um, beside me. So once again, thank you for uh, everyone uh, who are involved in this meeting. Hopefully this meeting will be um, wonderful and be useful for all of us. Uh, give a very good insight how to um, take care of our heritage to uh, to have our heritage uh, last for uh, longer by um, probably uh, storing some information in a digital form. Okay, once again, thank you and uh, enjoy this uh, seminar. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Dr. Agus Harjoko. Okay, that was the opening speech from Dr. Agus Harjoko as the head of the Department of Computer Science and Electronics. And now we are going to the main presentation by Professor Dr. Tehan Robert Sablatnik with the title of Computer Vision on Cultural Heritage Applications. Okay, before starting, I will read uh, first the curriculum vitae of Professor Sablatnik. Okay, Robert Sablatnik was born in Klagenfurt, Karintina.
Uh, you will hear a little bit about multi spectral image analysis of historical documents, so spaces for automatic transcription. And I'm going to tell you also something about uh, a time machine project that is a new project here in, the, uh, in Europe, and uh, where a lot of different uh, institutions are collaborating in the area of cultural heritage applications. Now, short word on what we are, a computer vision lab, as you see here, and is a group of approximately 20 people <clears throat> that work in the area of computer vision. And uh, these guys are mainly in uh, projects and uh, try to um, get computer vision onto applications mainly. Uh, the blue ones here are um, at the um, faculty level. That means also involved in teaching the rest of the people here is mainly doing research. And what research are they doing? Well, we have uh, four different uh, major areas in theory. First is three divisions, so everything that is uh, somehow um, concerned with uh, getting the 3D information and processing the 3D information of our world. Document analysis is also a, a large branch of our research where we mainly are in HDR and the layout analysis, as you will see, machine and deep learning, of course, as the methods that uh, give us the opportunity to do um, computer vision and motion and tracking. So we also work on uh, uh, videos and uh, try to extract also semantics from videos. What are the application areas? So medical image processing, industrial vision a lot, of course, also and cultural heritage is uh, one of the uh, application areas. Uh, furthermore, we have surveillance and immediate assisted living, especially for the video data. So what can you accept, expect? Um, should we tell you something about our Center of Image and Material Analysis in Cultural Heritage that we founded a couple of years ago? Uh, then we uh, take a closer look on multispectral imaging and you see what is uh, going on here in this area. Uh, how afterwards transcription can be done using the read transcribos uh, platform. And finally, I wanna talk a little bit also on the time machine organization. Uh, since this is the latest move in, all, in Europe uh, towards a um, huge project in the area of uh, cultural heritage. Now, the Center of Image and Material Analysis in Cultural Heritage was uh, established in 2014 and uh, is, uh, yeah, was mainly founded by these three organizations here. The University of Vienna and the Institute of Statistics are the ones that are interested in manuscripts and how to improve the readability in manuscripts and uh, how to find uh, writer recognition and other things. The Institute for Natural and Natural Sciences and Technology in the Arts of the Academy of the Fine Arts in Vienna. These are the ones that do the material analysis there. So these are chemical people that uh, try to get uh, more knowledge about the uh, material. And of course us. And uh, since, uh, well, two years or so also, the Dona University at Krems, the university in uh, nearby, is uh, uh, um, part of the TMAP team and also the research group of microbiology of extreme environments and cultural heritage of the University of Agriculture is also part of this um, center. And uh, what uh, is this center doing? Well, in principle, we try to combine material analysis, we, uh, we combine philology, image processing to be applicable in the cultural heritage area. And uh, yeah, so we, we work on, so we as uh, computer vision, we work mainly on um, image acquisition and try to improve the readability and try to find all kinds of other things. Here you see one image from the Vatican Library where we um, are frequently to scan documents there. These are the colleagues here. They do with uh, material analysis with spectrometers like this Bruker Optics Alpha Spectrometer. And here <clears throat> the aim is to find out which kind of ink, for instance, has been used to write a manuscript. So this is mainly for getting the particles in the colors in the in, in books, for instance. Uh, another a device here, an X-ray fluorescence a device that pretty much does the same. So it also here the idea is to get the, the more information about the material. And this is 
kind of uh, an example of what uh, can be expected. So on the left side, you see a palimpsest. So we have uh, two different writings on the, on, on, the, on the scroll here. And now the idea is to get more information of the underlying text. And you see here, we try to make this underlying text more readable. And uh, you know, the, um, the upper text is not so important here. The, 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 the main thing here is to get more information on what is on the page, even though this might not be readable for the human eye. And here you see also some application for stones where you can do exactly the same thing and find out what is uh, it's still left on stones, which kind of marks are there and what has been written on stones. So this is a short overview on, on which, in which area we are really working at. And now we're going to have a look on how it's done, how this multispectral imaging and cultural heritage is performed. And you see here one of our pages that we have scanned in uh, Egypt, in uh, the Sinai uh, cloister, uh, St. Catherine. And uh, this uh, manuscript has undergone some uh, water contact, and therefore the text that is written here is not really visible. <coughs> Sorry. And uh, if we do our image processing, then the text that was not readable before, as you see, oops, sorry, as you see, uh, is then reconstructed and can be uh, read by the um, philologist. So this is, in principle, what is the aim of the whole thing to make unreadable text readable again? And how are we going to do that? We do uh, spectral imaging. So as you see here on the left side, this is a conventional image. So we take blue, a green, and red channel, combine it to a, a color image as you have, uh, have it on your mobile phone, for instance. However, here in multispectral imaging, we try to get more bands and not only the visible bands, but also the ones that are not, not visible. So from the infrared to the ultraviolet, and you see here, uh, it ranges from 365 nanometers to 940 nanometers uh, traditionally. In the visible area, we are about uh, between 450 and uh, 700 or 625 nanometers. So we additionally take uh, bands. And of course, if we have additional information, we can get more information of the whole thing. And you see here, this would be the spectra of the conventional image. So you have the, here the, the blue spectrum, the green one, and the red one. So there are filters in the camera that filter out the red, green, and blue channels. We here in the multispectral image, we do it a little bit different. We don't have the filters on the camera. However, we have a different lighting uh, environment. And you see here, we have different light sources between 365 and 940 nanometers. And these different light source produce uh, a multi-channel, if you like, uh, image where we have eight or 10 channels, different channels that uh, have more information, of course, than only three channels. <clears throat> so the interesting thing is, and this is quite nice to see, uh, that the different spectra invoke the same sense of colors for, for a human, for instance. If you see here, um, if we have this kind of uh, dotted black line here as the spectrum for our sensors in the eye, so we also have three sensors in the eye, this would give this color, for instance. However, if you have another spectrum like this one here, it's exactly the same. Um, color. Why? Because these kind of frequencies add uh, themselves in different ways, and we will see, we, we as a human see the same uh, color because we have three sensors, red, green, and blue, and these three different sensors get different spectra and mix it together to the same spectrum. So um, this is, for instance, the 500 nanometer wavelengths. And what happens here, even though we have the same spectrum here in, in, uh, in our eyes, so we have the same color, we would have different ones in the 500 nanometer area. And this is kind of the trick that multispectral um, processing is, is, is performing so that we can still separate now better the different uh, spectra that we have here and the different information. So, Spectral analysis does improve the amount of information you have from different channels. And of course, you can use this for all kinds of applications. 
And this has been done for a long time, means 30, 40 years in the area of art history, where people uh, try to find out what is the status of the, um, of the painting, for instance, as you have here. Uh, this would be the visible light. And if you go back here to the UV reflected and the infrared and so on, you see different information here, especially in um, paintings, you might be able to see the underpainting uh, because infrared light is going through the uh, painting layers here and would um, get to the background of the image and see more information on what is on the canvas. And uh, if you take the UV, channel, for instance, you might see if the um, painting has been um, restored by someone or has undergone some changes and other things. So it makes sense to look in different spectra. And uh, that's why people are doing it for a longer time. Usually you do it either you use uh, different illumination. So as you see here, you can use lead into illumination now that we have many different colors. So there is no white at all in, in lead illumination. So it's always composed of some different colors, uh, usually red, green, and blue. And however, you can have, have different colors in LEDs and you usually, or you can of course use this kind of illumination for doing multispectral imaging. So you just have one camera, which is a monochrome camera, and you have different illumination color one after the other and uh, using these different um, colors in the time, you produce multispectral imaging. Or and this is the other way, you can use optical fillers. So you just take a monochrome camera once again, but you mount some kind of filters in front of the camera using a filter wheel, as you see here. And then you make an image, then you turn the wheel and have another filter and so on and so forth. So this, this would, for instance, give you the opportunity to take eight different uh, images, uh, one after the other. So um, of course, Every method has its drawbacks and benefits. This one has the benefit that it gets, it's, it's getting uh, very fast because you can fastly switch between the light sources. Uh, however, the, the um, LED illumination does not cover always all bands as we will see. Uh, with filters, it's a little bit better. So you can, can tune your filters such that you have all, the, all bands in your uh, spectrum. However, the change of the filters using the filter view takes time and therefore the acquisition time is heavily increased using this kind of filters. You see here, this is a typical spectrum of different uh, LEDs. And you see, for instance, in the area of 550 or 560, you don't have any light. So this is a, over here in 400 nanometers. There is no illumination at 400 nanometers. So every um, information that you might have in the original that is placed in 400 nanometers only, you will not have in your image because there is no illumination in this in this uh, wavelengths here. And the same is here and also here and here and here in 800 nanometers. So the, the problem here with different uh, LEDs is that they are very narrow banded and uh, an ideal way would be to have more of these kind of LEDs because then you can also, could also fill these holes as you see here. So it's not the, the, the best um, uh, illumination device as we have, but uh, well, these are kind of very costly and um, maybe we will increase the different wavelengths in, in the future. So we have uh, 11 narrow wave bands. In principle, it would be good to have uh, 15 of them. Um, uh, as a camera, there is a phase one, a 100 megapixel camera multispectral imaging, which goes from uh, 350 to 1000 nanometers approximately. In addition, we have a, uh, an icon camera, a DSLR camera to do uh, color images and a linear unit to position uh, the, 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 the book or whatever we or the manuscript between the two cameras. Additionally, also the filter we will we use that for UV fluorescence and like reflectography. Uh, because there you have to change between infrared UV filters in order to get uh, the correct uh, representation. So this is more or less the um, the acquisition device. As you see here, in the fluorescence uh, case, we need a filter in front of the camera. Why? Because we have UV illumination from our elevation device with the LEDs. And then we need the filter to block out the ultraviolet light as it comes from the light source. 
and we only let the visible light into the camera. What? Why is this the case? Yeah, because there is there are some um, inks and colors that have fluorescence effect. That means um, this is uh, the lower wavelength is is coming uh, onto the, the the material and is then reflected. So that the energy is 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 converted to a higher uh, wavelength and is then reflected to the camera. And this UV fluorescence can only be done using this kind of filter. So if you would like the, the filters of the UV light, if you would like to have a UV reflectography image, you again need the filter, but this time the filter for the visible light such that only the UV information gets into the, the camera. And you see there is a difference in the, in the resulting images. The UV fluorescence um, image is, has higher contrast because the ink is uh, somehow better visible because the, the, the background is has some fluorescence effect. So you get better contrast images using this kind of uh, technique. However, there might be also some hidden information that is then better visible in the UV band. So you need to have both bands. You see here, there's some information here that is not visible in this image. Uh, in the RGB, again, with the, with the um, camera, DSLR camera again, you will have, again, other information. So it makes sense to have this kind of uh, different, uh, different things here. And you see, for instance, this part that you see in the UV reflectography image is not present in the UV fluorescence part and uh, vice versa. Maybe also here, some things are visible, better visible here than here. And here also, this part is not visible. Here. So um, there are different, there's different signals in the in the in the material. So once again, you see our device here. You have here the LEDs, and they currently we have green LEDs on. This uh, this is some kind of diffuser in order to get uh, diffused light onto the surface. Means that you get the same amount of light everywhere in the acquisition area. Here you have the book that has to be captured. Um, here you might see the DSLR camera. This is the phase one camera. Uh, this is the multi spectral camera. This, by the way, is a Hamamatsu camera. And uh, here, um, the red light, and here again, the white light, which are additional light sources here in order to get all kinds of different illumination. And uh, this is traditionally the, the, the place how it's done. So once again, you see these kind of diffusers, you see the light sources, and you see this linear unit that is transporting the object from left to right and uh, the different cameras here mounted in place. And uh, this is, for instance, in Sofia and Bulgaria and this in Vatican, and they are pretty much always the same. So we travel with this kind of device from uh, place to place and get the images. Uh, one interesting thing is how to correct the focus because the refraction angle uh, from, the, from the lenses is wavelength dependent. And therefore also the focal plane is wavelength dependent. And uh, if you use com conventional lenses, they are optimized for the visible spectrum. And uh, if you use, however, ultraviolet and uh, infrared, then you see that the lenses that you use make different things. So if you have a sim simple lens, this would be the, the, the wavelengths here in this area and here the, the focus. So ideally it's always in, in zero. So that focus would be in zero place here. If you have a simple lens here uh, from blue to red, you get uh, you get already here some errors in the sharpness in the image automatically. So it's uh, good to use some achromatic lenses or apochromatic or the super super achromatic lenses in order to stay in this uh, in this focus thing here, especially if you are working in the ultraviolet or the infrared area here, because this you see the lenses are not made for these kind of wavelengths here. That's why you have focus shifts, and this focus shift, of course, cannot be corrected in the post processing. Therefore, there is two different ways. Either you buy these very, very, uh, very, very expensive lenses, as we have seen before, or you just correct the focus shift because you know which color you are or which wavelengths you are uh, um, using for illuminating the scene here. And uh, the idea is now to calibrate the lens and to autocorrect the focal plane depending on the wavelengths and distance. So what we do here is we just take different uh, wavelengths and 
find out where is the focus here to, for using this to just take this kind of uh, device here, not the focus calibration device. And the thing here is this would be the, the plane where the camera is focused on. And this is in a 40, 45 degree angle, a, a scale where you can find out the depth of field. And uh, for each invisible wavelengths, we do this kind of uh, taking a picture and we read the focus offset on the scale. So that, what does it mean? So this would be um, an example. We, hear, we are here um, focused on the visible part here, for instance, at 535 nanometers. And you see this is sharp and as well as also U sharp. However, if we move up to um, infrared, you see that all of a sudden the focus would be in this part. So there's a change of focus in the, in the area there. And if you further go up, the, the focus, uh, the, the center of the focus will get, get uh, further up. And uh, if you look at the ultraviolet part, you will see that this is also the case. Uh, however, there the effect is even more. So what you do, if you don't correct for, the, for these lenses here, if you just use uh, one position and no super expensive lens, your images will be unsharp. Whatever you do, these the images are unsharp. And therefore, you have to correct for this kind of unsharpness during, during the uh, acquisition. And um, if you do this kind of uh, calibration for several distances, you can fit the function. As you see here, this would be the distance between 40 centimeters and uh, two meters. And you can then fit the function here and you get some kind of um, correction function for the focus in different wavelengths. So this would be the focus shift and uh, this would be the different wavelengths as you see here, 365 nanometers. Here we are in the ultraviolet. You have a large difference, whereas in, uh, in, uh, yeah, in 700, which is near to the red part, is not that, that uh, heavy, but still heavy. Great. So um, if you have done that, you can either drive an autofocus motor, which is a nice uh, thing because it's very fast or you just use another linear unit to adjust the working distance. And we do this for, especially for ultraviolet and infrared um, images in order to correct the focus there. So uh, most of the people do, do not do this and they, wonder if, they are wondering why the images are not so nice in the ultraviolet part. And this is the reason why. So you have to adjust the uh, focus and it's best done using an autofocus and a steerable camera. And for instance, this um, phase one has the possibility to just uh, do the focus correction here using a program. And uh, then all the um, different distances are sharp. And you can uh, use this kind of, of, of synchronization between light sources and camera uh, very nicely. And yeah, so if you have no corrections, this would be uh, UV image, everything is unsharp. If you have a correction, uh, the signal is sharp and the images can be nicely uh, used. And um, why it's good to have these multispectral images is, for instance, here, this is a traditional way of infrared. So if you use infrared light, you can look through um, painting layers and see what is hidden in the painting layers. If you use uh, this for passports, for instance, you can see what is in the passport. So this is UV example uh, from the Austrian passport. So there are some photos in, in there, for instance. And of course, you can use that for uh, manuscripts and can increase the readability in the manuscripts. There, as you see, nothing really readable there. However, now it's readable. And also here, white light image on the left and UV fluorescence image on the right. And you see there's difference in, and uh, this is a typical multispectral image from UV reflectography up to white light image. And these images now are the basis for our multispectral processing. So what are we going to do? We take all these different channels, um, register these channels to one another such that one pixel in this um, image corresponds to the same pixel in that image, for instance, through all the layers. And using this kind of processing, we can now make the underlying script visible. And also the other thing is to get 
rid of the overlying script more or less because this is a problem because the overlying script has has uh, overlaid the underlying script so it's a problem to have the, this everything uh, taken out because uh, this is not possible but still you can heavily improve these kind of, of images using this technology now how is the registration done in the multi-spectral imaging um yeah the registration is necessary why because um, otherwise these pixels between the different images would be in different places. And that's why they have to be aligned in order to get only one vector per pixel. Uh, and to can, then you can use this kind of information to, um, to get some bands in uh, highlighted and other bands uh, erased, for instance. But there it's necessary to have this kind of uh, correction. And why is the misalignment there? As we have already seen, it's chromatic aberration. It's uh, changing filter. So if you if you have, if you change, if you if you uh, correct for the focus, there might be still some chromatic aberration, so that the that the the, the, the rays of the color are still not at the right place, and uh, therefore they are not at the same. The pixels are not at the same point place. Um, of course, you might have also unnosed mechanical impacts or deforming parchment. This is very often the case that the parchment, as you you're doing the the uh, images is moving due to heat, for instance, then everything is moving and using these uh, images is then uh, complicated because the pixels are again in different places. And for this thing, chromatic operation changing filters, as you see, focus correction, as we've seen before, we, we can yeah, calibrate our lenses and work on that. However, for the other parts, it's still not possible. So unknown mechanical impacts. Here, of course, you can do some kind of a fine transformation, but for deforming parchment, this is not possible because they can uh, deform in any direction. And therefore, you need some kind of, of correction method afterwards. And uh, what we want to have is, as you as I already said, is we would like to have one um, vector where all the pixel values are in. And then we just, um, uh, have uh, the possibility to look at one pixel in different wavelengths and with different channels. This little bit is like hyperspectral imaging as it's done on remote sensing. Here with multispectral imaging, less channels, but still the same idea. And using these uh, different channels, this um, yeah, will give us more information about what is in the image and what can be um, uh, get, get us information from the image. So, why do we do this kind of uh, registration? Because we need the spectral signature for each point. This can be done afterwards for having some information about what is in the image and what color is there, for instance. So we don't need a uh, X-ray fluorescence uh, anymore, but we can use this one. And afterwards, we can use also machine learning to work on this kind of different images. And visualization, visualization is also possible. So. In reality, you have some kind of chromatic aberrations. And, uh, this means that you have misalignments and focus shifts. We already talked about that. Uh, if you use different filters, especially with a filter wheel, this also is changing all the, the setting here because uh, the rays all of a sudden do not uh, come to the right position anymore. So this is a filter. And uh, from this filter, you would get some deviation. And this deviation is, 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 is done here. And of course, this deformant parchment you see here. If you have some light, then everything would be uh, moving into this direction, and then you do have different parts. And of course, there's always something uh, happening in acquisition areas. And yeah, this also has to be corrected. How do we do that? Uh, we do this kind of uh, deformable registration. We just use densely computed image descriptors and um, like see or whatever and lose use this kind of information at different points and try to follow these points and create this kind of uh, deformation field so there's really a local um, registration of all the points such that they fit to all the other points in all the other channels how is this done so first we start with a course registration which is of course an affine registra registration and afterwards we do this fine registration where we optimize for the whole image area and close the starting configuration uh, as, as, as required. 
and then we just move in different parts of the image uh, uh, as it's necessary for doing this local fine registration. And this, of course, is um, heavily done in uh, medical image processing, and we adopted these uh, methods in order to get the um, images aligned to each other. And here you get some some uh, results for these kind of things. So there's a, this little image and a green image, and this would be an uh, infrared image. And if you use these kind of channels, this would be uh, a difference image after a fine transformation. You see that there is uh, parts that are nice, but there are parts that are not so nice. Whereas we, if you do it with the weighted local mean, for instance, we get here the better local um, registration of the image. So here are another, some kind of other images and what we can be done with these kind of uh, things here, different channels. And this is then the um, enhanced channel. And the next part is to use these kind of channels that are already registered to put them together into a multispectral image. And here you see what is done. We take these kind of different images and compress the information that is contained in these kind of things. Why? Because most of the layers display the same thing anyway. And uh, we are interested in the thing that are not displayed by all these different um, layers because these sort these, these parts contain the interesting information. So what we like to have is a decomposition. And uh, traditionally you do this kind of decomposition using some decomposition method like DCA, principal component analysis, independent component analysis, analysis, ICA or LDA. Um, and um, or you do some clustering of the different uh, signals here, or in our case, we use some kind of uh, classification. And uh, uh, we use this, uh, either this part here, the LDA part for some classification, we do some machine learning. And uh, the problem here is how to produce training classes or training examples. Uh, why? Because every manuscript behaves differently. And uh, we tried to do this kind of thing, but however, it doesn't really work. Why? Because there is no real uh, method behind the whole thing. And that's why we use these kind of principal component analysis uh, parts. Why? Because we have highly correlated images. So pretty much the same information all the bands as it is with uh, the images that are from remote sensing. And therefore, we can use this kind of information there and use uh, the principal components. So we have the first principal com component and the second one, which is perpendicular to the first one. And um, yeah, we can use this uh, multidimensional data and can reduce it. And what does this thing do? It removes the spectral redundancy. The bad thing is here that these two axes are perpendicular to each other. And if you use, um, um, other um, methods like independent component analysis, you can um, adjust for that. So if you see here, if you have a perpendicular axis here, you're neither in this part nor in that part. So independent component analysis can decompose observation in independent signals and the basis is not necessary orthogonal anymore. And this of course is much better for for these kind of, of uh, images, but still you can improve it by using linear discriminant analysis where you can discriminate between two classes. And what we have here is foreground and background. And um, this is perfect for this kind of, uh, of data set because what we now can do, we can maximize the component axis for the class separation. That means we can nicely separate the foreground from the background, so we have the minimum of the within class scatter while we maximize the between class scatter. However, labeling is, is required. So this is a, it's a big topic here. And of course, we would like to have an automated procedure, so no manual labeling. That's why we came up with a labeling method that is doing this automatically. So as input image, we use an image on which the characters are most visible, for instance, the UV fluorescence image or the PCA transformed images, or one image where you see good contrast then. And then we do some coarse enhancement where we use the text lines and, and fine enhancement where we use the text lines and the characters. As you see here, this would be the input image. As you see here slightly, there is some text here maybe, and there's also here some text. And if you use the whole 
area here you see here is a text area more or less and in between there is the, the background area so what we need to use in this course enhancement we just find out where are the lines and where is the where is the, the background and use this kind of different information all the different bands to separate it various you see here there are, there are some bands like here in this area here where the two signals are nicely separable and we just use this kind of, of, of frequency distribution for the foreground and background to enhance the whole thing and you see here uh, this text here is better visible here here maybe not so good but we can still improve it how because now we use this course enhancement step to get the characters and do the same thing again on the characters and we just use some kind of binarization here like the zooms method here and use this binarization method where the characters are and do the same thing once again so now we have as the chorus with uh, enhancement result this kind of image we take the black parts here to uh, use again the, the frequencies here for a nice separation and this would be the background and we can still improve the foreground from the background now this works quite nicely as you have seen a couple of times why because we have nicely separated two different classes namely the foreground and the background and also here uh, where this is nicely visible why because there is a foreground and background and using this kind of uh, information you can perfectly separate these uh, two uh, classes here and you see here there could be the different uh, results for different decomposition algorithms um great but how can you find very nicely the where is the the text and where is the background well one way is for doing, doing ruling analysis so what is ruling analysis we have some kind of ruling in all these different um writings why because the rate the writer in, in ancient times uh, were using always lines and they were writing on lines and if you have different rulings in, in for instance a manuscript you would have also different scripts in there and how to find these rulings so here this would be the ruling of the underlying script how to find these kind of things well they are still visible in the in the image uh, in the in the in the, in, in the uh, manuscript because they have some kind of different shape in the, in the in the manuscript so you see the lines if you closely look at the lines you see these lines still in the manuscript somewhere and if you for instance see this kind of page and you see the ruling here that has lines here here and here this means there has to be some underlying text that is uh, two column text that is going from here to here and you see still here the ruling and the ruling here is not corresponding with the writing here this means there has to be some underlying text behind the whole thing and once you have found the whole thing you will also be able to see that there is some underlying text on the, underneath why yeah because you see the ruling and again if the ruling doesn't work uh, it doesn't fit there is some uh, some 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 information hidden there how does one get these kind of fine structures raking light give you visual hints however um we're gonna have a, a, a new way on, on how to find that namely photomatic stereo photomatic stereo is a very nice uh way of reconstructing 3d surfaces and in in the end such ruling information is nothing else than 3d information on the parchment and uh well how it's done well you take a camera and you take different uh, light sources from different angles make multiple images that's why it's called photometric stereo and you find uh, these differences here in the uh, local surface details why because the maybe small engravings here make different shadows here and you see these different shadows from different illumination angles ah, very nice and uh, very long time people know about this technology however it has more or less been done for uh, 3d reconstruction in, in, in a general way however uh, in this specific application, this works extremely nice. Why? Because you have some uh, very small differences in the in the surface here, but you can use this information very nicely in uh, by using just different angles of illumination and combine the whole thing into one image. And you can use this, for instance, for coins as you see here, and can reconstruct a nice 3D model. 
And we did this, for example, for a Roman coin. And uh, the original uh, was about two centimeters. And this thing here is uh, 10 times bigger, just using this photometric stereo and a couple of different images. Uh, and you see here, this is our light dome that we have uh, made here with some kind of LED lights inside and uh, 54 high power LEDs. And uh, the diameter is about 80 centimeters. This is for most of the, which is fine for most of the manuscripts. And yeah, with using these kind of technologies, you can uh, reconstruct the whole thing as we had before. So this is, uh, should not be here. Um, and what you can see is more structure on the surface here. You see, these are the ruling structures. You might see also some kind of engraving of the of the writings from the backside, or as it's here, maybe from the from the side where you're looking at. So you get more uh, uh, information here. The undertext is as engraving or impression visible. So you can use also this information for getting more on the on the on the text. And you can also display it here in uh, for the ruling analysis. But you can also display it for the characters only. So this would be the, 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 the 3D information on the surface. And again, you can use this ruling information to do our multi-script spectral uh, separation very nicely. So we have virtual lighting for arbitrary directions. And using this, we can enhance the surface structure. And you, afterwards, you can, of course, change the surface specularity and have all kinds of, of analysis done uh, for this kind of thing. And of course, you can also use 3D computer graphics and have this kind of 3D representation of the manuscript as it was uh, taken. And you can, of course, un undistort all the surface because now you have a 3D shape of the surface. You can undistort it and all kinds of other things. So this is from, from, from what has been done in the, in the acquisition. Now a short word, what else can be done uh, using this text that we have uh, seen there. And there was a, a huge project called Recognition and Enrichment of Archival Documents Read, where the read transcribus uh, system was developed. And this, this, this transcribing system is there for computer scientists, for humanities scholars in archives and libraries, of course, also for public users. They can upload a page that was, uh, for instance, uh, improved with multispectral imaging and can then automatically um, transcribe the um, text that is there. So the idea is this is the image and this is what you afterwards get. So this is OCR, like handwritten HDR, handwritten text recognition, OCR for manuscripts, which is kind of complicated because the, the writings there are handwritten. And of course, everything that is handwritten is complicated to, um, to read. And uh, yeah, here, uh, like 10 or 15 partners were working together in order to get these kind of things done. We, we as uh, CDL have made a scan then we will see afterwards uh, shortly what it is. Um, then we have automatic layout analysis and uh, other partners were doing the baselines and document understanding and write identification was also our part. And um, the, the, the goal was to have uh, technology prepared for non-technical users to get the information of the images. So what is the scan then? Again, we are using the image acquisition here. Um, this is some kind of acquisition then where you put your manuscript on and uh, yeah, we get this kind of, well, there is already produced. So we have uh, about 200 euros can you buy this then. And what is the good thing? It, it is working with a scan app, so-called doc scan, which is automatically um, getting the images, finding if it's sharp, it's automatically cropping the whole thing. And you just have to turn these pages and they, uh, the, the system will automatically make images with your mobile. Upload it to the transcribus sensor and there the magic happens. Namely, we can use this kind of platform to transcribe the whole thing. And this is what you get out. So this is the text that you get in and afterwards you get this kind of text out. And uh, this is uh, available for many, many different uh, scripts. It's not language dependent because there is no whatsoever dictionary behind. It's just trained on character level. And uh, here you see the character error rate, which is approximately 3% only.
So with unseen text, you just take upload the, uh, an image of, and you get a carrier error, error rate of about two or three percent. Now even less. This works perfectly fine, and therefore uh, lots of users are using this system. So uh, you see, we started in 2014 or so. Uh, 2015, there were 2,000 users. However, in 2020, we have already 40,000. How do you find the text in ancient manuscripts? Since you're fast, until recently, computers weren't very good at reading handwritten scripts. But now, artificial intelligence brings a break. The Tyrrhenian State Archive in Innsbruck stores countless documents dating from the 11th century onwards mostly official records, legal documents, and other important handwritten documents from the past. Transcribing these books isn't easy, but this archive is working with scientists to automate the transcription using cutting-edge computer technologies. With difficult script like this, I believe the new technique will have problems. But with relatively nice calligraphy like this, the new system has great advantages it helps us a lot. To digitize such books, scientists working on a European research project, READ, designed a simple to use system based on a specially developed smartphone application. It detects when pages are turned and automatically takes high resolution photos of each page. Then, so this is, of course, a combination of low tech and high tech. I this tent is a relatively simple low-tech accessory, but it works with a high-tech app running on a smartphone that's connected to the Transcribus platform. The app uploads the images to the server that performs the recognition of the handwritten text. Transcribus simplifies tasks that would often take years of work helping scholars with complex handwriting and unusual layouts. Dr. Mario Clara uses it to describe the 500-page hero book, the most significant anthology of medieval German texts commissioned by Maximilian I in the early 16th century. The, uh, in diesen, in diesen the big advantage of this system is that it provides a link between the image and the text and does it in a very simple way. So the transcriber has the full overview immediately. <laughs> That's a way to reduce error to a minimum, which can't be achieved with any other system. The server at the University of Innsbruck uses machine learning algorithms to teach the computer new writing styles. After users transcribe part of the text manually, the software engine learns to identify the characters and then finishes the task automatically with impressive accuracy. I'm giving the computer an image and the part of corresponding text, and based on that, the computer can learn this handwriting script and similar fonts. The system can transcribe text in any language, bringing together scholars and scientists, archivists, and volunteers from many countries. The developers are planning to make Transcribus commercially available to users around the world. We were even surprised by the great success of the project and that so many institutions are in touch with us expressing an interest. And as we want to continue to offer and expand this service, we're starting a spin-off company. Great. Um, and we move on. What can what else can be done? So on a European level, this is one of these uh, these attempts there, but uh, we even go further with a time machine. And, uh, and a time machine is a collaboration that tries to get uh, the 5,000 years of European history to life. And it will start or it starts with digitizing millions of historical documents, paintings, monuments, and whatever. And uh, the idea is to get a large computer simulation. And uh, of course, it's open access, interactive, and uh, will um, revolutionize the education and so on and so forth. So this is kind of the idea behind the whole thing. But um, this time machine and this is the, the main thing is that we have a massive digitization infrastructure and high performance uh, computing there and to get more AI into the, into the field. And again, some video here that you will see 
uh, what is, is the, 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 the idea. The problem is that um, the far you go away from the future, the less data is available. And the idea is to get more data and to augment this data such that we get more information of what has happened. And using this digitization, because there's a lot of, of material still in archives uh, that can be used to kind of to model like a digital twin of the, of the history here and get the information that uh, is now still hidden in the archives. So this is the idea of this, uh, of this uh, whole project here. And uh, what we want to have is some kind of time slider to the world. And uh, what enables the whole thing, of course, artificial intelligent machine learning in order to get this kind of 4D technology, which enables a navigation through the time. And there are already uh, local time machines there. So we are working, for instance, on the lower Austria time machine here in this part, but there are different partners in Europe that work on different, like the Antwerp time machine is one of the, the leading ones where uh, these kind of, of, of ideas are already put into, into, uh, into reality. And uh, the idea afterwards is to put all these different time machines to one another the continent. and get yeah. them together. In archives, beneath stones, in crumpled maps and winding streets, in pictures and paintings, in the depth of its green forests, history in Europe lies everywhere. How does one preserve and explore such a dense and fragmented past? How does one bring it into resonance with our contemporary world? In 2012, the Digital Humanities Lab at the École Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne launched the Venice Time Machine and offered unique virtual immersion into history thanks to the development of big data and artificial intelligence technology. <clears throat> Since then, dozens of European cities have taken similar steps. Each now contributes to the creation of a unified temporal exploration tool accessible to all. All these initiatives are now gathered within a consortium that groups together more than 250 European partners universities, archives, research centers, and also private companies. Time machine participants include historians, engineers, geographers, developers, entrepreneurs, researchers from a variety of backgrounds, as well as ordinary citizens, defenders of their heritage. Chaque ville du réseau de la Time Machine pose des défis particuliers. Et donc chacune des équipes qui reconstruisent Paris construisent Budapest ou construisent Amsterdam ou Anvers, nous permettent de développer des compétences spécifiques. I believe that the time machine is the future. How we will do digital humanities and humanities in the future. What we are striving after is really building things that are used to get new insights. First step: collect and aggregate data thanks to digital tools and automate everything in order to carry it out on a massive quasi-industrial scale. So we have all those data, we have to store that properly and manage it properly, but we also have to make sense of the data. If you just present to the people thousands of terabytes of data, it's meaningless. Today, science and technology can profoundly transform the cultural heritage with an impact on research, education, new applications, economy, and society at large. Il y a cette idée d'être capable de, de, de fournir à l'utilisateur final des moyens complètement innovants de naviguer évidemment spatialement, euh, même si c'est pas aussi évident que ça encore aujourd'hui, mais aussi de pouvoir naviguer euh, temporellement. The past thus becomes an invaluable resource to develop new tools of knowledge, an essential testing ground to train algorithms and consolidate progress in artificial intelligence. The time machine would also provide Europe with a unique ability to preserve endangered heritage. Il doit y avoir une prise de conscience sur le patrimoine qui doit au moins être comparable avec ce qui est en train de se passer sur la chute de la biodiversité animale. Quand un site 
disparaît, ce sont des pans entiers de connaissances que nous ne pourrons plus jamais utiliser, comprendre le présent, anticiper le futur. Preserving the past in order to withstand the test of time, but also to cope with the worrisome trends and living conditions on Earth, and respond to the wayward ideology affecting our times. Notre rôle, c'est vraiment construire et mettre à disposition cette base de données, cette encyclopédie, exactement dans le même esprit que les encyclopédistes de, de la période des Lumières qui voulaient compiler des connaissances. Ben, on cherche à, à, à compiler dans ce nouveau matériau qui est le matériau numérique, cette richesse culturelle, cette richesse sédimentaire qui décrit notre passé. The race for the digitization of our past will not only be run by representatives of our public and scientific institutions. There is still a risk of seeing our history privatized, which raises the question of our society's ability to tackle such an issue. You can argue that Google can do that better than anyone else, right? Uh, they have the best algorithms around. Uh, and I still think that it's crucial for Europe to you know, do that on our own terms. If you imagine that uh, an algorithm will only crawl those aspects of our cultural heritage that it finds most relevant to its advertisers, uh, you only get a very partial uh, idea of what the truth is. This is an issue of culture, identity, politics, economics, and ecology. The Time Machine Consortium must convince European society to share in this project. L'Europe est un moment clé de son histoire. Elle doit décider qu'est-ce qui est le plus important en termes d'investissement. Un des enjeux de Time Machine, c'est donner une possibilité d'ensemble négocier l'histoire commune pour envisager et co-construire un futur. So, this was uh, short overview on uh, what we're doing in CVL up to what is um, going on in the European level, where we are, of course, a part of. And I, of course, would like to thank my collaborators, Simon Brenner, Fabian Holas, and Florian Kleber, where you have seen the results of their work mostly in this presentation. And I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm um, happy to answer questions from your side. Okay, thank you, Professor Savlatnik, for the presentations. And now we are going to the next session that is a discussion. In this discussion, we will first accept the three questions from the audience in this forum. Okay, uh, if you have any question, can you turn on your mic uh, or mention your name or you can write in the chat box. Okay, uh, three questions at first. Please, if there are any questions. Okay, if there are no questions, I will just use the question in the chat box. Okay, the first question. The first question, Professor Sapletnik, uh, what motivated you to research further about the field of computer vision, especially on the topic of cultural heritage? I'm sorry. Can you answer. Okay. Uh, what, what, the motiva what motivated you to research further about the field of computer vision, especially in this cultural heritage topic? Yes, uh, this was uh, actually was in the year 1992 when I was still a student. And then I found some kind of advertisement from some uh, guy from ecology who wanted to have some kind of um, aid, some visual aid for doing archaeology, namely to get automatic profile sections of, uh, of uh, fragments. And this is, as a student, I was very interested in this part. And then I made my uh, master thesis on this topic. And this, well, this was the start of all these kind of um, yeah, motivation, maybe, for this topic. And I'm still doing that. And um, I'm still very interested in doing so, in, in doing these things. And very interestingly, um, the, the things I worked on 30 years ago are, are still popular because still people are working on this fragment reconstruction and things like that. So. It seems that there is always some, some people in the world that are interested in getting um, high-tech algorithms in an area 
namely the humanities and help people there to find more information using this kind of technology. And when I'm working with these people, they are always very thankful that we provide new insights to their material. And this is very, very motivating also for me to you know, still work on this, this topic. Okay, thank you, Professor, for the answer. I also think about the cultural heritage is very important. We can save the cultural heritage with the research about the digitalization of the cultural heritage. Okay, uh, next for the second questions, we have another question. Okay, this it has been explained that if they are deformable from the object, there is deformable from the object, uh, can the same method be applied to the deformable that occur from the camera? For example, using white lines or maybe fish eye lines, can it be ex uh, reformed back to the original image? Yes, yes, it can, it can also be done if you have some kind of, uh, of, of camera distortions there, you can do the same, the same thing, of course. Um, and um, it doesn't really matter whether it comes from the material or from the, from, the, from the lens. However, usually if you have a camera and the lens, you can calibrate the whole thing. So if it's calibrated, there is not much, uh, much movement of the, of, the, of, the, of the points in the image. And uh, except from, from temperature, so if the temperature is changing, that, that might also change your optical system. Um, but yeah, of course, you can do this also afterwards. It's no, no problem. But in, in principle, if you do this kind of acquisition, you first calibrate all, everything you have, and then this makes your life much easier. And you don't, you don't have to cope with different sources of uh, distortions. But if the, if the manuscript, for instance, is moving, you'll have a single source of, of movement, and it's much easier. Because if you have different uh, sources of your, of your uh, distortions of the image, then you have to have different models for these distortions. And then it's getting complicated, because the only thing that you see in the image is the movement of the, of the points that are not at the place where they should be. And uh, you, you cannot estimate from which kind of, of, of reason is, 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 what is the reason for these movements. And if you just have everything calibrated and there's only one movement, it's easier. Thank you for the answer, Professor Zapadnik. OK, uh, another question. Uh, OK. Earlier, you said that transcription, tran transcription is a language agnostic because the character level is there a possible there is there is a possibility that there are font or character that have not been covered in the vocabulary and about the learning and detection about some character that not even exists in the vocabulary okay. well, actually we don't the, the thing is that the, the the vocabulary is trained by the users so uh, the transcription system does not really um care about the script or the language however it does care about um, your, you know, what you're doing. So first, in, in principle, you, you just send the system maybe two or three transcribed pages. If the, if the, if the uh, vocabulary and the characters are not there, um, of course, it will not be able to recognize uh, these characters. However, afterwards, you get some kind of, so what, what usually is done there uh, from these users, you get some result back. And then we ask the, the users to correct these results. And while correcting these results, the, the system is retrained. And uh, with this kind of te technique, so this is kind of uh, reinforcement learning, if you would like, uh, from, from the users, with this technique, you sooner or later get all the, the characters that are in, in, in manuscripts. So we don't have any vocabulary, we don't have any dictionary, we have, don't have nothing. That's why this kind of system is, is working for all different scripts. So it works for Chinese characters as well as for Latin characters or Arabic characters. So there is no, no difference in script. The, the only thing is that it's trained on a corpus and this corpus or the, 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 the character where it gets better and better, the more you train the system. However, you cannot use a universal uh, model for all scripts because this would decrease your your uh, recognition rate. So what is usually done there, you train or adopt a model to your kind of data. Also, if you, of course, if you have only one, one or two pages, this doesn't make sense. But in principle, we have um, uh, users that have thousands and thousands of pages, and these pages are mostly similar. So what is done there is you train then a local model for exactly, so you start with a normal model, and then you adopt the normal model to your specific model, and retrain the whole thing, and then the character uh, error rate drops 
dramatically. So now in the new version, we have uh, character error rates about 0.5% on retrained text. So it's, it really does work. And we uh, currently have 50,000 users that are using the system on a regular basis. Okay, thank you for the answer, Professor. Uh, another question. Uh, this question is, if we have traditional tense object in this, in this uh, is this also possible if we use computer vision to be applied? Some, some example is like a traditional dance. Yes, Can yes. Be implemented? There is, there are some colleagues in Japan, that this, this is called intangible heritage. And intangible heritage is more complicated because um, there you, you, you the problem is if you just scan it in, you don't get the, get the idea of what is going on there. That's why what, what these guys did is they, they took people and they were performing the dance and they had some kind of markers on their body. They were performing the dance and then the dance as a person was modeled. And uh, then you have this kind of, 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 of scanning the dance using the, the, the person that is there and the, and the reproduction as a 3D, um, a 3D person in, in like a, an avatar that is, is doing the same moves as the one that is dancing. So this is one, one way of getting this kind of tradition into the computer. So you have to have the dancers and you just track the, the dancer with motion tracking and then you model the movements and then you somehow get this kind of thing. But however, this is always complicated and this intangible heritage the problem is also in, in, in theaters or operas. So imagine you have an opera by Mozart, for instance, and um, you have lots of theaters that are performing the opera. None of these kind of things is the same. So you have always different interpretations of the same thing. So how to, 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 to cope with all these different interpretations of the original scene? So we will never find out how Mozart did his operas or how, how it was intended because just writing it out on, on music scores does not really transport the, 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 the intention of the, of, the comp of, the, of the composer. And that's why it's the only way of, of getting this model is to have lots of different um, yeah, ways of interpreting it and put them together and then you find out the different the violence variance in the, in the interpretations of the, of the whole thing. So intangible heritage Documentation is a very, very complicated thing. People are working on that, but there is no, no real solution ready. And that's why people also work during this time machine on, on this kind of, of, of problems. Okay, thank you for the answer, Professor. Okay, and is there another question? Okay, if there are no question, maybe I, I will ask one question for you, Professor. Yes. Actually, I just uh, very interested in your presentations. It uh, about the multispectral image and multispectral camera. Uh, yes. I, I wanted to ask: uh, Can we just create a multispectral camera using our smartphone, like smartphone today? I, I, I see just your presentation that the, the spectral camera using some like the uh, uh, Canon or maybe uh, a high-end camera. Can we just create a multispectral using a regular smartphone like that? Yeah, in principle, yes, because. Um, most of our mobile devices have already an infrared uh, capability. It's not that high, but you, you get up to 700 and 800 nanometers anyway. But if you look carefully at your mobile phone, you will see an infrared filter in front of the, of the camera, uh, which is blocking out the infrared light. Um, in principle, this could be made with a movable filter like the Sony night shot night cameras have, but um, there is not much use for, for this kind of, of application. So, to be that something is built into a mobile phone, there has to be a huge number of users that would use that. And I don't see the application for this kind of, 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 of thing. First and second, we also need, but most of this for infrared is not the problem, but ultraviolet. Uh, you need also an ultraviolet uh, illumination source on your um, mobile phone, especially for indoor um, applications, because outdoor you have with the sunlight, you have all the, 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 the spectra there. Um, so the answer is in principle, yes, it would be possible. It's not really complicated. However, there is no application I can imagine that uh, lots of people would use such that the sensors get cheap enough to put it into the mobile phone. Okay, thank so you for so infrared much. sensors, it's a little bit different okay. because now the, the new camera, the new mobile phones are, are um, having these 3D, 3D sensors on them. 
and they are mostly based on infrared. So infrared sensors are already in. So in principle, you could use like the new, new iPhone for making infrared uh, images and infrared uh, yeah, examinations. Ultraviolet, not so much, but infrared is there. Okay, thank you so much, Professor. Okay, the, and the last question from our department. Uh, is there about a PhD program in computer vision learning with the cultural heritage in Indonesia? Or, or there are research collaboration with your university, Professor? Yeah, well, we have one one guy, Otto uh, Frisky is, 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 is here doing these kind of things. And there is no, there is no real program, but uh, of course we do have collaborations with different partners. And uh, what we would like to have, especially in, 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 in Europe, as we have seen here, is a curriculum for different universities. And uh, this is also maybe part of the time machine um, initiative, because it's not only uh, digitizing, but it's also a uh, focus on that, on uh, learning, uh, on teaching, on all kinds of, 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 of things. So the, the main problem is that people should be educated in uh, humanities and technology. Because nowadays you either have uh, people that are educated in humanities or you have ones that are educated in technology, but there is only a few people that have both areas. And the idea is to, to attract people to, to move into the middle of between these two areas, because this helps to improve the, the, the field a lot, because then you understand more about the others. Because I, it took me maybe 20 years to understand uh, humanities a little bit. I, I'm not trained in that, but I understand a little bit what is going on there. But it would be good if people would have two studies in both fields, and then then it would this would be really really nice. And uh, this is what uh, we are also currently working on, especially in Europe, to get these at least a couple of places where you can do that. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Zabludnik. Okay, that's that's all of the okay. questions. Thank you to all all the questions. Uh, before we come to the next session, I will first uh, inform about the Professor Sabdantik will leave from this event because uh, there are another event schedule maybe later. Uh, I, have to, of, I yeah. have to give a lecture now. Oh and yeah, same, right. the same topic. <laughs> okay. On behalf of the Semilens team, I would like to thank you so much, Professor Sabdantik, for joining us in this event. Thank, thank you, you very much. Me, thank you for giving me the opportunity to bring, present some of my work. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, then. Uh, your seminar. Yeah. <laughs> okay, then we come to the next sessions. Uh, a presentation from Mr. Alpha Klaus Zatukusuma Frisky with the title of the challenge and change on Indonesian cultural heritage research. And before starting, I will read first, uh, read first about the curriculum vitae of Mr. Alpha Klaus Zatukusuma Frisky. Uh, Alpha Klaus Zatukusuma Frisky was born in Surakarta, Indonesia, at uh, 1990. He received the bachelor degree in Department of Computer Science and Electronic from Universitas Gadjah Mada, Indonesia at 2012 and MSc degree in Department of Computer Science and Information Engineering from National Central University Taiwan at 2015. He currently a doctoral student at Computer Vision Lab Institute of Visual Computing and Human Center Technology, TUWIN, Austria. His research interests include uh, computer vision, single image reconstruction and its application in cultural heritage preservation. Okay, that's all for the curriculum vitae of Mr. Alfaklaf Zatu Kusuma Frisky. And now for the second session, I would like to invite Mr. Alfaklaf Zatu Kusuma Frisky to present the challenge and chance on Indonesian cultural heritage research. So to Mr. Frisky, so Mr. Frisky here, okay? Time is yours. Mr. Frisky, can okay. you hear me? Okay. okay, yeah, I'm still there. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, can you see uh, my presentation is happening here? Okay. Uh, uh, Huja, can you see all of my presentation in here? Yes, I already said. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you for all of the all of the participants that uh, have joined uh, join us in this session of the computer vision application or cultural heritage. Uh, I, uh, in here, I just want to explain the 
the whole concept of this computer vision application, especially uh, in the Indonesian artifacts. So I just will give an example how uh, what kind of heritage that can be uh, perceived or maybe can be used uh, by the computer vision and then have the general information itself about the cultural heritage uh, and then how the computer vision uh, computer vision will help uh, this preservation or how to actually the main point of my presentation is uh, to attract more people to understand or maybe to interest in this cultural heritage application on the computer vision so let's start uh, in here i will explain about the indonesian artifacts so the first one is me uh, my name is avokat zetokusuma friski in here i'm a lecturer uh, at universitas gajah mada especially in uh, laboratory of electronics laboratory uh, Department of Computer Science and Electronics, and then I'm the doctoral student at Win, especially in the Professor Robert Sabladik lab in the CVL, and then uh, yeah, Professor Sabladik is uh, my supervisor in here. So yeah, I did my research interest in the computer vision and the three D reconstruction, especially. Uh, in the cultural heritage uh, and then for the computer vision and the cultural heritage preservation. So in here, uh, the first one, uh, the first I came to uh, Tailwind, I, I really didn't know about the cultural heritage, but uh, as I learned in there, I just realized that there is a lot of cultural heritage uh, in Indonesia that still have a chance to get a, uh, to be researched on. So if you, anyone want to contact me, you can just contact me at uh, alphaclaf at UGM or alphaclaf at CVL to win by email. So the outline of my presentation today is I want to introduce you to my, to what kind of heritage, what is, uh, what kind of heritage uh, that can be used in, in the computer vision and then uh, what an application as well, and then I will I will explain you uh, some example uh, some examples to the Indonesian heritage, uh, for example, uh, like a tangible and the intangible heritage. So maybe some of them uh, uh, we even didn't know that we can carry uh, carry the research on uh, on that kind of the heritage. So. Maybe it's, uh, I will just give, give you, uh, all of you, a new idea on, uh, or a new uh, insight uh, for this. So, oh, that, that, can, uh, that kind of uh, heritage can be used by the research for the computer vision. And then I will just give an example of the computer vision application. Maybe it's a one or two main rough idea, not the detailed one. Uh, just the rough idea, so the people can know uh, uh, what kind of perspective uh, from this uh, from this heritage they will be carry on. So some, something like, uh, for example, how the common uh, available methods can be applied in the uh, cultural heritage artifact. And then I will just explain how the experts and the community needs. And then, yeah, that's uh, the conclusion of my thing. And I will just give the conclusion of um, my talk today. Uh, and the common, usually the computer vision application area, as we know, there's a lot of uh, application that uh, usually uh, most people they reason research on on the topics, for example, like uh, the medical images or something like that, and then uh, for the uh, driving for the car, electronic cars, automatic cars, because there is a from the low research, and then from the biometric for the face recognition, or the eye, the the biometric or uh, the other on the other one, like uh, yeah, like 
the a fingerprint or something like that. So lots of people doing that. And then the segmentation and object detection, for example, if you want to uh, uh, detect or segmentate something in the in the room or something like for uh, in this example, and then how uh, we recognize it and then we classify it. Yeah, and this is for the retina, for the biometric, and then the crowdsourcing, like a counting of people and then detecting the behavior, the anomaly behavior or something like to detecting the unusual behavior, for example, in the airport or something. So we can just know, uh, we can just detect it using the, the CCTV or maybe, yeah, maybe at other capturing device or maybe a smartphone or something. So uh, in here, so why is it so popular? So, and in fact, for uh, why uh, the other, uh, the first one is like, because of the completeness, because of most of the data set and the data, the data itself, the data uh, is recorded, uh, is complete. And then most of them, many people, uh, the second is a con consistency because most of people, the cost system and give the improvement on there. And then the uniqueness too, because uh, maybe for example, in the medical, uh, in the medical uh, data, this is so unique because there is a rare case. And then because there are sometimes some people like, most people, uh, it's quite a rare, uh, like a, a right disease or something because there's something happened or for example, in this case, like uh, the COVID-19, and then there is uh, a lot of data that will be impactful, like uh, around, uh, the run of the the X-ray from the lung uh, people, how uh, the people that have, uh, that either the COVID-19 or not. So it's quite a unique because there is uh, that's why the medic medical uh, image is also popular in there. So the validity because of a lot of expert and then many, not not really an expert. Sometimes it's only use uh, the common people uh, can validate, uh, validate, uh, validate it and then it get a high accuracy as well. But yeah, cultural heritage that I also have all of them because of the completeness, consistency, but not many people work on this. That's why it's only, uh, uh, it I just want to say that the cultural heritage data also have a chance to become such a popular and impactful as well. For example, in here, uh, some application on cultural heritage is like uh, the 3D reconstruction, the, this 3D reconstruction of the building or the artifact, or maybe on some kind of uh, monument or something like that. And then, uh, yeah, from the palimpsest, uh, this 3D convolution uh, for this 3D reconstruction will help the uh, expert as well, just to know uh, uh, people doesn't, doesn't need to go in there, uh, uh, in that place to understand how the building is look like. And then, or maybe it will be easier to, uh, for people for another countries to uh, collaborate each other. So it's like, uh, for example, in this situation like uh, COVID-19, so it's uh, this kind of approach will be useful. And the other, the other addition of advantages of using this 3D uh, to, uh, to digitize all of them into the 3D, uh, into the uh, digi digital data is to preserve because um, most of the artifact is decayed or sometimes it's destroyed because of the environment, especially in Indonesia, because in Indonesia, a lot of uh, disasters uh, and then the high rain and then high temperature and the different temperatures can destroy the artifact as well. So it can be seen that this kind of, uh, uh, this kind of research area is uh, important. 
And then for example, to, in here is to uh, scan off the room into the 3D and then just make uh, some kind of uh, 3D museum or something like that, just uh, to invite uh, many people to know, uh, yeah, feels that to went to the uh, the place itself without without going there, without going in there. So, yeah, it's a one way to preserve. And then it's uh, also in the matter script. It can be used use it to to detect all of the handwriting or maybe how old the paper is, and then yeah, and maybe some of the uh, like uh, the professor something Nick before is like uh, bef like a professor somebody told before is some of them is a disappear or something like that. So we want to improve it and to be the reader readable. And then sometimes the paleontology is like, uh, for example, in Solo, there is a lot of, and there is a museum for the Aboriginal people. Uh, there is, uh, yeah, something like, uh, how I can say, uh, something like uh, the bones that can be found in the Aboriginal people and then the old people. And so we can just date them and then scan them and then maybe reconstruct them bef uh, before the real thing is going in itself. And then, of course, uh, we can do in the relief uh, in the temple. So this is the example of the Indonesian heritage as we know, like uh, artifact and then batik and then the temple and then the puppet, as we know that is also uh, the Indonesian heritage as well. And then the stone, I mean the, uh, the manuscript on the stone. So as we know that this is the common Indonesian heritage, as we know, uh, that uh, we, that we have uh, in the daily life. Or sometimes uh, some of you is just come to the to this place, and maybe we didn't know that that this this kind of object can be a research for us. So in here, I just uh, just uh, mention. Uh, about the tangible and the intangible of this uh, cultural heritage. The first one, uh, the tangible. Tangible is uh, some things that have uh, the physical appearance and the intangible is the non-physical appearance. So in here, I just want to give an example that uh, that can be used, that can be used as a computer vision application. So for, uh, for the first one is the tangible Indonesian heritage itself. Uh, so tang tangible cultural heritage is uh, the heritage, uh, the artifact that have a physical presence. So for example, in here is uh, like a building, the houses. Uh, I have uh, uh, several PhD, PhD uh, friends that already uh, finished their PhD, but just only using one or two uh, in architectural design of the Indonesian heritage, uh, Indonesian houses in only in one area. So it's a quite quite a huge chance for this. I mean, because uh, as we know, uh, there is a lot of uh, Indonesian uh, houses in each region of Indonesia. So for example, uh, in, in Java, we can uh, find like a Kraton or something like that. So a little bit, they have a, so they just give a connection about the story, how how this, uh, the story of the houses itself, why, why this room have something like this on, there is a, some decoration in there or something like that. So it's, is a nice challenge for them. And then the second one is the dresses. I mean, the, the 
the dress or I can say the, the costume or in each region has a different motifs. I mean, a different style, has a difference, uh, maybe how they use it and they how they perform it. So it's it's like it's a quite a challenge for for us to give this kind of uh, uh, because nobody works on it yet. I mean, as I know, I mean, I mean in the maybe. Uh, in my uh, in my knowledge of uh, all, the, all of the paper uh, that form the computer vision area that works on the Indonesian dress is not common, so it's not as well as uh, not so many. And then the puppet, as uh, the previous uh, I mentioned about it, because the puppet in Indonesia we have a lot of puppets designed. For example, in the Japanese puppet, and then the others is like. Uh, uh, another region like uh, Jakarta or maybe from the yeah Jakarta puppets, it's uh, quite a different puppets, but all of them is a cultural heritage. So we can just use uh, some kind of sculpture vision in there. So it's a chance to put it in there. And then also is a music gamelan. So there is a, a lot of different shapes. So we can do some uh, three reconstruction in there or maybe some uh, uh, so, uh, maybe some uh, to take a picture or just to digitalize it, and then we can use some kind of museum. It's, it's kind of great. So the location, location uh, for the tourism as well is also the cultural heritage for uh, in Indonesia. For in uh, uh, in this example, is Oerebo, and and then we can just scan all of them, and then we can see all of the environment, how they built the, the, this heritage area. And then, yeah, we can just scan it. And then using, uh, some of them is already done in the Prambanan or Borobudur temple, but it's still a chance in there. And then we, we know about the painting as well. We have a Avandi painting. So it, uh, just like, a, previous uh, presentation by Professor Sadlaknik, we can do some kind of uh, maybe most multispectral imaging or something like that, or maybe some kind of uh, image processing in there just to know how the style of uh, the uh, Afandi, how the painting is different with each other with uh, compared to maybe the other uh, location like uh, Europe or something. And then, uh, uh, we have a manuscript as well, like uh, the Kraton manuscript. And then uh, as we understand, maybe in, in, in Java, there is a special uh, Javanese uh, word or Javanese, uh, yeah. So we can do that as well, using this uh, to detect and then to the motive, just to preserve it. So for the intangible Indonesian heritage, uh, is like uh, like a tradition of the living expression, like inherited from the ancestor and passed onto uh, onto the descendants. So in here, the difference between intangible and uh, tangible is like uh, the intangible doesn't have a present, doesn't have a object. So it's like, uh, for example, in here is a song. Uh, so the song itself uh, from the ancestor uh, has been given to the uh, descendants just to know how this song uh, and then each region have this uh, have their own song or something like that so it's quite of uh, unique so for example I say the unique uh, in this cultural heritage because this this kind of heritage uh, doesn't appear in the other country so Indonesia has it. And then here, uh, just as Professor Sapletnik mentioned before, is a dance. So the dance itself is a, is a moving of people just to dance uh, some several uh, techniques of dancing. One of a uh, region have their own dance, they have traditional dance and based on this 
uh, variation is quite a quite a lot because of Indonesia. There's a lot of region that, as we know, there's uh, there's a lot of region that have uh, their own traditional dance, and we can use it as a data. And then, as we know, it's like uh, martial arts. It's all this is also uh, the heritage as well. Like uh, in here, it's pencaksilat and maybe it's another because it's already pencaksilat is already recorded on the UNESCO as well. And then is a story. Maybe, uh, maybe in here, it's a story about the Timun Mas or maybe another story. But uh, this is just for the, an example of the Indonesian heritage. So how we prove it or maybe how we use it on the culture uh, on the computer vision. So in here, I just give an example. I will just give an example of the Indonesian cultural heritage and maybe we can use it as a research idea or maybe for the bachelor or master or even the PhD degree. For example, if I want to do a 3D reconstruction, so in this a 3D reconstruction, I can use it on an artifact on temple or the location. For example, what I'm doing, what I'm doing in here is I want to uh, reconstruct of the uh, temple, a relief temple using uh, like a single image, single image. So uh, what I want to say, I, what I want to do is to improve the performance of the, to improve the performance of maybe uh, the, the archeologists to understand more or maybe to digitalize it uh, easier rather than only uh, just using the 3D scanner or something like that. So for in the, I'm using to for the artifact and then we can use uh, to scan on the temple because in Indonesia, as we know, there's a lot of temples uh, spread on the, all of the region on, in Indonesia. And then the location, the location in here is what I want to say is uh, maybe, uh, uh, for example, in the Borobudur, uh, we want to uh, see how the environment develop, uh, how the tourism spot, we are doing the 3D reconstruction and then uh, we can do, for, for example, for the urban planning or something like that. So we can just do, oh, there is a, uh, the change of this uh, on this area on, and then the others. So we can do that for the, so we can also do this reconstruction in the other artifact as well. So on the, uh, for example, the uh, palimpsest or maybe on the manuscript, but it's really depend because it's a uh, really high uh, technical object in there. And then we just uh, need to know which one is better, uh, which uh, method is better than the others. And then artifact restoration, like as a presentation, uh, uh, just like a presentation by a professor Sablet me before, it's like the old document or manuscript or all artifact uh, need to be reconstructed. In the in this for the old document, as we can see, we can, uh, for example, because of the old age of the manuscript, some of them is disappear or maybe. Some of there is a bird, or maybe because of the water or something like that. So the tin is a disappear. So the in uh, yeah, we can just use this computer vision to do some a restoration. For example, in all artifact, is because of all of um, there is many pottery, old pottery, uh, are found in the solo beside of the. Uh, uh, Aboriginal or maybe old people. I mean, there's a lot of poetry. Uh, uh, there is a lot of um, old poetry that break down to the others. So some of parts is a disappear. So we can just restore it, uh, restore it, uh, it into the complete poetry. 
and then we can just do a human skeleton recognition for example is a staging and fox dance uh just uh but just uh uh, as uh, Professor Saplatnik mentioned before, we need to know why uh, this, uh, how it can be preserved, how uh, what uh, how this uh, can be used by the community, not only the human skeletal recognition itself. And then, in addition, for example, the folks dance use a traditional. Uh, costume or something like that. So it's also become a noise and it can be a challenge. It it can be a, a new challenge. So not only detect the human skeleton, so it can be, uh, uh, we need to create a human skeleton recognition that can see or maybe kind of be robust to the costume as well. Or here I also human movement, uh, different, Difference with the professor Sablatnik uh, says in the European because in European it's a little bit abstract. I mean because of the staking and the fox gen, uh, in here in the European is a little bit abstract. So the difference within Indonesia is most of Indonesian fox dance is uh, they have a story. They have uh, maybe a special. Uh, gesture and it can be used to different one to the others one dance to the others so as as for example in in for the human eyes is like we know that oh this is the jaipong dance or this is uh, from the Batawi dance or something like that so it can be recognized or be classified for them and then for the document analysis is a manuscript and inscription as well as a uh, presented before, and the style analysis, uh, you can we can use it at batik. As we know, the batik has uh, there's a lot of batiks in from Indonesia. Uh, not only from, from Jogja batiks or solo batiks have a different style. There's a lot of style to do in there. And then multispectral imaging for the old document painting or palimpsest, or sometimes we can use it in the cave painting on the uh, cave painting so we can use how these people in the old before century use uh, how to paint it and then the in painting is a uh, it means the in painting is the uh, to recover because for example there is a several pattern and then there is a missing pattern in in the sum of them so this in painting can be used to complete it, just to give the give more understanding to the to the experts to know. So the challenge, the challenges, the challenges on Indonesian cultural heritage is the first one is the limited resource. As we know, uh, because of the three, for example, for the three D scanning is quite expensive. There's a lot of people. Uh, there's a lot of people almost didn't use it. Uh, because of this limit of resource, uh, actually nobody, uh, not many people work on it because of this a lot of the high expensive one, expensive uh, just to do this uh, research. But there is a lot of, this is, they can become the challenge to create uh, the cheaper one. So it can be a challenge. That's why I said it in the challenge because we, uh, uh, how to create the cheaper uh, preparation with the same uh, quality of results. And then limited number of the artifacts. So we, uh, for the machine learning, it can be a problem because there is a limited number, but for the restoration, it doesn't need to be a train. So we can just use uh, image processing in there, but it's still a challenge for. And then the regulation of the government itself, for example, actually it's not uh, because the cultural heritage in each region have the, of course, is a, a belong to the government. So in here, what I want to say is this regression, uh, because 
of this research on the cultural heritage is not too many. Uh, because of it's not too many, uh, uh, because of that, it's not the regulation of the government is not a structure. So sometimes in my case is when I want when I went to Indonesia and then want to do this kind of research, uh, sometimes uh, they didn't know what is what I what I need to do. I just they say that they uh, I just need to get a permission from the center. I mean from the central for in Jakarta or something like that. So it's kind of uh abstract what i need to do or something like that so it needs to be improvement in there and then hard to find the researcher with the same interest is because uh, not many people work on this and then but it's quite a challenge but it can be it's a new area to be researched on because of the uniqueness and then how do you find the expert who can work on the modern digital digital Talisation. Sometimes uh, people, for experts, means for example, from the archaeologists, just need to, yeah, from the archaeologists, still stick to the the old way. Sometimes, well, yeah, sometimes we find uh, people like that, and then we must pro uh, we must follow the protocol to preserve the artifacts. For example, you. Because of this limited number of artifacts, sometimes we need be to be a careful to not to destroy the artifact itself. And then because of the remote area, for example, of the artifact uh, had been, it's been located at the middle of nowhere, no electricity or something like that. So it can become a challenge and give a new way to preserve with the same quality in the remote area. And I uh, cons uh, have a consultation with uh, some of my college in the uh, Department of Archaeology. Uh, in here, uh, what, the, what is actually expert needs? Uh, the first is transfer knowledge between two areas because it's uh, uh, in here, we want to merge between the computer science and uh, maybe, for example, in uh, I will give uh, an example of the archaeology or maybe the art and humanities. So we need to transfer knowledge between two of them. This transfer knowledge is between the qualitative and the quantitative. Usually, usually a people in the experts of the art and humanities is use a qualitative experiment, qualitative to qualitative uh, analysis to the artifact. Besides, on the other side, for the computer science, this usually is using the quantitative aspect. So we need to know uh, the transfer chronic between these two to become in the middle. So, so we understand the qualitative and the quantitative as well. So there can be a good collaboration between them. And then uh, about the precision, uh, we need to uh, have the artifact is digitalized as precision as as it can. For example, for example, is the high quality 3D reconstruction. It will give uh, have a big help from the experts. And then, for example, the relation between art, different artifact. And in here, for example, in in the Prambanan temple, there is a relief that story about the Ramayana, and then. The, on the others, uh, on the, there is a book, there is an old book that uh, have a story between them, uh, between the Ramayana, it, uh, it's the same with the, the relief in the Prambanan, but it, it's a same story. So they need some relation between these two uh, different artifacts and then they need the story behind them and then we need to provide the data that can be used by them to create this relation. And then the object detail and the completeness, uh, completeness we need to give uh, as detail as it can to the object and the, all of the complete uh, the artifact. 
and we also need to we also give uh, it to the community not only for the expert so we also uh, they also need to transfer knowledge between two areas sometimes people didn't know about the computer science things for example in here yeah i don't know if from if any uh, if any college in uh, that uh uh see this youtube uh this my presentation is from the archaeologist or maybe the others area uh except the computer scientists so they need to transfer knowledge uh how this can be merged or something like that so they also want to platform that easy to understand and also interesting as well and then the application that improves the product uh, production for example they uh for example for example the puppet they want to know to uh improve the production or something like that and then yeah that's uh, one of the example from the platform that easy to understand is yeah maybe just to know that uh to make the transfer knowledge is easier and then the application that can help the people who need maybe for the expert for uh, for the example, for the disability, this, I have a disability people that want to know, uh, want to want to read, want to know about the temple or something. So we just need to give the detailed explanation and easy to understand. And then, yeah, that form the 3D model as well. And then the data. Of course, the community needs the data community needs to be data to be researched on. Yeah, and the conclusion for the cultural heritage in Indonesia have a sufficient, actually have a sufficient value to the become a research material. As we know that there's a lot of uh, artifact, a lot of heritage, uh, cultural heritage that we haven't heard yet, or maybe, oh, we didn't know that it can be a research material or something like that. So. All of us is only focused on the, maybe the data on the mainstream, like a medical Im images or something like, or, or maybe uh, automatic driving. But uh, in here, the cultural heritage uh, also have a sufficient failure to become a research material as well. As we, uh, and it become a great chance because as I read, as I read in the journal in the uh, Scopus in Quartzil one in Q one, there's a lot of uh, research. Uh, yeah, there is not too many research there research in Indonesia. If there is a research to be Q one in Scopus, most of them is has been done has been done by the Indonesian people that maybe a study just just like me uh, study in the in the European or maybe uh, in the foreign country, so it can it is be it can be is. So, what I want to say is, this area it's still available, even to become the uh, Scopus, because for example, it's for a researcher, it's still a high value, and then it can have a sufficient value to become a research material to become to create a publication in the Q1. And then the challenge that exists for computer vision can be used as a motivation and the novelty values. As, as I said before in the challenge, so for example, from the remote area for the expensive data, it can be a motivation, a new motivation and the novelty value and then need more collaboration between computer science and cultural science, and then need improvement from the government side. So in here, what I want to say is uh, government side is, uh, uh, as I know, as I know the one that have a research center for, this, for their cultural heritage is only on Borobudur. As I know, I don't know about the others, but uh, most of the governments institution that maintain it is only using just for maintain uh, like a traditional way they didn't have a, any digitalization or something or maybe that can create a more research to preserve to show they only just use to maintain it 
like uh, clean it or something like that. But uh, different with uh, like a Borobudur's con uh, conservation center, they have their own research center. So it can be it can be start to create this research center in this all of the museum or something in in Europe in European museum. Most all of them have their own research center, even in in even in a small museum. So it can be in Indonesia. I know there is a lot of museum in here, and I hope that all of them have their own research center, like uh, capturing the data and then show it to the community and the stu uh, to study, to make uh, the researcher can create the data. I mean, to get the data. I mean, that's the first way. And if you, if not, for example, in, uh, in, in this computer scientists, maybe we can try to start a collaboration with the museum or something. And then uh, I also want to mention that uh, we create a collaboration research on the computer vision on cultural heritage between the University of Gajamada and then Teubin, especially in the here is especially in here is for the laboratory of electronics and instrumentation department of computer science and electronics. Uh, Universitas Gadjah Mada between and uh, they have a, we have a collaboration between uh, uh, between uh, the tailwind of um, the computer vision lab. So if if anyone want to do a research on this cultural heritage thing, we can you can contact me or maybe contact the department of computer science and electronics. And then we also have a collaboration to the Borobudur Conservation Center and then the uh, Department of Col uh, Cultural Science or Department Archaeology of Cultural Science. For example, I have a college in there and we have a collaboration to do it. So if anyone wants to do a research, we, uh, we can start together in there. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's all of my presentation today. Or uh, maybe um, I hope that everyone get, uh, get a new insight, a new insight, or maybe a new idea to create a research on the cultural heritage. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Ruja. I will get back the time to you. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Frisky, for the presentations. And then we are going to the discussion session. Okay, uh, in the discussion session, we will accept about the live uh, question. Uh, for anyone that having any question in this forum, you can turn on your mic or you can write your question in the chat box. Okay, the first question, third question. Please, there are no question, live question. Okay, I will just check the chat box. Okay, Mr. Frisky, there is a question in the chat box. The first question is, uh, a lot of heritage objects in Indonesia is owned by government. Uh, as researcher, can we just get the heritage data directly just like a tourist or we need a specific step how to obtain that? Can you explain about what, what your experience about how to obtain uh, some of the heritage data from Indonesia? Thank you. Okay, if we want to have uh, th this data and this publication, of course, we need to, we need uh we need to get the permission from the government. Yes, uh, in, in my case, I have a collaboration with the Borobudur uh, con uh, Conservation Center. And then because they have their own research center, so they hype about it when I come. So yeah, and then for uh, I will give the example for my friends as well. Uh, in From my friends, they have used a big, research on the building, on the houses, like I mentioned before, they are the houses and then they uh, need a permission from the local governments. They don't need, so I think if we want to take a data and then we want to uh, publish this data at least, uh, maybe not, not only publish the data, only using the maybe using the data and then get the method, uh, publish the method, if we do that, we I think we don't need to give uh, the government just like a tourist. It's okay, but if we want to uh, publish the data, 
into the public, we need, of course, we need to the government's uh, permission. Uh, yeah, it's it, it also. Um, but just to make it easier, giving the uh, getting the permission for the government is safe for us. Yeah, it's, it's, it's rather safe because uh, we didn't know that there is a problem uh, later after we publish, uh, we didn't want that. So for example, we just want to say, it. we just need to say to the government that we want to do the publication stated to, and then there is a term and condition there because uh, as we know that yeah, not only in Indonesia is uh, all of in the all of country that in the world that yeah cultural heritage is owned by government. If you want to publish it, we need to permission from the government. Okay, thank you, Mr. Presi, for the answer. Okay, I hope that can solve some of the question that uh, maybe as as the researcher in Indonesia, we also need to know how to obtain that. Okay, the second question is is, is still in the same topic. Uh, is it possible to push the government to create specific regulation for heritage preservation in data? As, as you mentioned before, there are no uh, effort for, from the government to making the heritage into the data. Uh, I Actually, I really didn't know about the regulation, how we push a great regulation or something like that, but because uh, I'm a computer scientist, so maybe uh, friends from the regulation can be explained that. But uh, as I can do as a computer scientist is uh, go to the government and then at least if, if we didn't, uh, that the government didn't have any research, our, uh, research team or something like that, at least we create our own research team. And then, uh, for example, if you are from the institution from the university, at least you need to uh, back up, uh, back uh, up, or maybe an uh, uh, institution that, that back up your intention. For example, if you are a student from the university, you can say that, uh, yeah, I'm a student from university and this data will be collected by uh, me and then it will be preserved by the Department of Computer Science, for example, like that. So if we cannot, uh, for I, I didn't know about the regulation, at least uh, we know that we need to get the permission, at least uh, the permission for research in all of this uh, cultural heritage is already in there, but they didn't have their own research team. So actually it's already open. If we want to do a research in this specific a cultural heritage, they will allow it because they have their own rule about that. But about the data, how the, this data can be published or something, of course, there is a term and condition in there. Just follow the rules, follow the how they want. I, I, I mean, because sometimes, uh, because digitalization is uh, easy to obtain and then most of people, most of government people, just to to be afraid that this data will be owned by a uh, foreign country or something like that. So we just need to say that this data will not go to the foreign people, but we will do it for research. In uh, and it be it can be owned by the home institution. For example, if you are a researcher from the institution, it. Uh, it will be a, uh, yeah, it will be a great chance for them because we have the data and then we have the way, uh, we have this data that is unique and then we own by ourselves or maybe, and then we just publish it and then at least, uh, yeah, we just publish it at least. If we want to publish the method, I think we don't need to uh, just give the information to government. But if we do the data, uh, we upload the data, I think we need the per uh, permission from there. Okay, thank you so much about the answer, Mr. Rizky. Okay, that's all about the topic about government. I think we, we also have still have a many open uh, uh, chance to research about this data because government also don't have any specific regulation for that. Okay, uh, okay and then, about the another questions okay 
Okay, this is about the reconstructions. Okay, you 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 mean that uh, you explain that uh, we can restore the original state of the uh, reconstructed data like that. Can it done with the machine learning, or we, we need specific thing to to make it done to restore the uh, for example a destroyed object just like a a temple destroyed temple. Can it can you make it back with using machine learning? Uh, if we uh, if the question is if we can do it or not, of course we can, uh, but it's really depend on the data and then uh, with uh, the the research on the cultural heritage, it's really depend on the experts. So for example, uh, we cannot do a reconstruction with, without the expert because we didn't know the original uh, the original uh, shape of the artifact before it getting destroyed. So we need to, we need uh, experts uh, explanation or maybe uh, knowledge from the expert based on the expert. So we can say the ground truth is an expert. The ground truth which is true or not is an expert, but uh, can, uh, I will limit this because sometimes we just create or maybe reshape all of the uh, uh, done by like a temple destroyed and then getting uh, to be reconstructed again and then without without the expert's opinion we just do it by ourselves. No, is uh, this research on cultural heritage cannot be done cannot be done that way. So we still need the expert to verify is it correct or not all of them. And then for example, uh, some people, I heard that some people in uh, France to do some shape recognition or maybe uh, uh, what is it a counter recognition on Mona Lisa on Mona Lisa painting, and nobody cares because what why nobody cares about that because they didn't didn't have an expert to pick up why you do that so to start this cultural heritage uh, application, I mean, this cultural heritage research, we need to, we need the expert. We need to expert like, uh, for example, like uh, 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 archeologists for the artifact or maybe, yeah, something like expert like that. So we need the expert to verify or our program or maybe our work is, is good or not. But if the question if it can be done by machine learning, it's it's always possible to do any to do that kind of things. Okay, thank you, Mr. Frisi, for the answer. So we still need the expert to make it possible. Okay. Uh, and then the next question, this is about the location challenge. As we know, the Indonesia have a lot of uh, heritage that come from the remote place that is so difficult to access. So is, if we wanted to take that, to collect the data from that heritage, is it a complex, a difficult machine, or we can just using something so simple, just like maybe before presentation from Professor Sapilatnik, using the camera, just camera, or, or we need just uh, some complex technology to do that? Uh, yeah, as I mentioned before, the main objective of this cultural heritage is to help, is to help the experts. So sometimes uh, for the remote place, uh, so it uh, just I mentioned in the challenge because of this uh, location, the environment, it can be a challenge or maybe because of this real condition can be a contribution if you have a new, published a new paper because you can say that uh, because of this uh, remote place in Indonesia, I will bring some method to improve the performance or something like that. But if uh, at least uh, we cannot just do uh, some reconstruction or maybe some uh, data mining in there. So we just go there and do data mining and maybe later I will do it. Uh, what I want to do is later. Uh, the first one is the data mining first. So uh, as my suggestion, don't do that. You still need an expert to do that. So uh, sometimes uh, we, uh, it can be done by just simple uh, acquisition, like uh, for example, Professor Sabdani mentioned it in the previous uh, presentation, using the camera and then using the 
uh, phone or something, or maybe a digital camera. Yes, it can be done. And then for the technique, for example, if I want to do a super detail, so we just need to do a close range using the photogrammetry. So it, uh, we can reserve the detail. So uh, uh, what we do from, we choose the complex or non-complex, it's really uh, depend on the expert needs. If his experts only need just for the quality that not to be that detailed, so we can choose the phone, so it's okay. So the main objective of this computer uh, computer vision or maybe all uh, research on the cultural heritage uh, between the computer scientists and the uh, arts and humanities scientists is uh, is a uh, how the expert needs what what the expert needs to do. So that's why we still need an expert to do that. So simple or not, we can do it simple, we can do it or not. So, but to save a time, we still need uh, experts' exp uh, opinion, what this expert need to do, what expert want to do or something like that. Okay, thank you, Mr. Prisci for the answer. So we still need the expert opinion to get what the data we need. Okay, that's very amazing. Uh, and then for the last question, there's last question here. It's asked for the, your experience in studying Austria, especially in this heritage topic. Can you uh, give us some uh, some story to that? Uh, if uh, yeah, it's a it's a great story actually. When I first come here, I. Uh, I have my own proposal, my own proposal, as just said about the face recognition or something. And then because the environment, all of them is work on the cultural heritage. And then I have a new insight. Oh, because the Indonesian cultural heritage is so rich. And then there's a lot of things that I can, so that I can to do. So yeah, the, that I want to do is for my first years, I just do a calculation, all of the what data it needs. And then I have a consultation with the experts. And then I have a friends, uh, two friends in Department of Archaeology in Indonesia. Uh, uh, both of them is a lecturer in the Department of Archaeology. Is a uh, Mr. Fajri and Mr. Uh, Andy Putranto from the Department of uh, Archaeology. I consult with them what they need. And then, yeah, I have uh, come up with this idea just because of the needs of the expert. And then uh, for the method in here, I get a lot of insight from the method, what method that I should choose. And then uh, what problems that I might solve, uh, that I should solve first, and then how I can do this kind of research. Then I back to Indonesia, take some data and then back to here and then just just do a research as usual using that the, the data because the previous one. And then after my research is going on and then I'm still in contact with the expert in the Department of Archaeology. Yeah, it was nice. And then, yeah, actually, actually it's, quite a, it's, it's quite a shame that or maybe because most of them in Indonesia didn't do this research heritage thing because maybe it's too old fashioned or something. But as we know, the cultural heritage data have quite rich. It's really rich of data. There's a lot of uniqueness in there. So, and I, when I saw the published journal, published journal in the Q1 and the Q2 on the computing of archeology, span computing of uh, writing document or something, most of them is using their own regional data set. So I think, uh, for example, in the Spain, there is a lot of uh, manuscript and yeah, something like that. And then as I think, I think it's, it's a time for Indonesia to do that kind of research because there's a lot of Indonesia before people from the uh, prefer from the other country have a uh, have a chance to this kind of research because I found one or two research that that has a similar, uh, maybe as a little bit similar, and but it's doing from the Japan using the Indonesian data. But it's it's quite a shame in that. So let's start. 
let yeah let's start this up uh, this research on the cultural heritage because it's quite a well yeah maybe after I coming back to from here I will do that. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Fuiski. Hope that story will encourage our researcher to making that possible. We need to reconstruct our heritage data or own heritage data to be our own, right? Okay, thank you for all the questioner that have been giving the questions. And thank you for Mr. Frisky for the presentation and the answer for the questions. Okay, finally, we come to the last session of the seminar that is the closings. And uh, on behalf of the team, uh, I thank again to Professor Sablatnik and Mr. Frisky for the presentations. Thank you to all the audience for your participations on this seminar 2020. And then the seminar uh, 2020 is over. And hopefully all the information that we have shared today will be useful to us, to all of us. And for the last information, the seminar certificate can be accessed in the YouTube descriptions. Okay, thanks for your attention. I will close this seminar. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.